So um, I'm here to talk about something a little bit different. I've been looking uh, at the other lectures that most people you know, gave you, and I think this is going to be a little bit uh, of a different flavor. Um, so as, as your colleague mentioned, I come from a research background. I guess I'm an unusual CEO. Uh, most people actually sort of like get their hands dirty much, much, much faster when they're in their 20s, like you guys, hopefully, uh, which is great. I'm in my 30s, old, I know. Um, but I think I picked up some things along the way that potentially helped us in shaping I guess what we call the next internet. And I'll talk to you uh, about it in the in next presentation. So um, here's one of the projects that I've been actually working on for quite some time at a company called Willow Garage. Who has heard of Willow Garage here? Perfect. <laughs> Perfect audience. So um, what we have here is a robot. So we, got here, uh, we, we, had a, we have a robot that costs about $400,000 that uh, you can control by you know, using web interfaces and a bunch of different types of software. Um, and in this application, what it does is, you know, if you're a lazy engineer or whatever, researcher, you're going to order beer from your office, and you have this robot going around the building, searching for refrigerators, finding one, opening it, uh, figuring out if what you ordered is what's available in the fridge, picking up the beer bottles, bringing them to your office. How cool is that, right? Super cool. Replace beer with your, the beverage of your choice. I mean, you can imagine you can have soft drinks or anything like that. So, uh, so this is a project that we embarked on at this company called Willow Garage, uh, which I'm going to talk about um, more during my presentation. The goal of what you see here is uh, pretty much to, to uh, create personal robots. Right? And as you'll see in our paradigm of where computers are going, this is the next computer, pretty much. It's a computer that's like not only mobile because you can move it, but it moves by itself. Um, so this is what I would like to have in my lifetime, to be honest. Obviously in a much nicer form and shape and doing more interesting things. So um, as I mentioned, we, we're looking at computing a little bit differently than, than others. You know, we're saying, hey, we got mainframes, we got PCs. All of a sudden we sort of like redefine um, the idea of mobile, right? Because it's not like I, kept, I get my laptop and I move it with me. I, I pretty much have it all the time in my pocket. And that's when we, we brought in this like mobile smartphones and tablets. Wearables are coming next. You can't escape them, right? You should probably embrace them as soon as possible. Forget about Google Glass. Okay, yeah, that was a failure. So what? There's more to come, okay? So this is clearly something that people want. Um, and again, in our perspective, we're going to redefine mobile again. Re-redefine if you want. And, and personal robots are coming next. Right? And so you have different types of technologies that are needed to build these kind of computers. Um, and they will basically have different types of sensors and actuators and so on, as you see here. So are we ready for this kind of robots, right? Like, do you think we're, we have the technology? Can we just make them happen like tomorrow? Yes, no, I don't know. Yes? yes. OK, some people say yes. Not by a long shot, OK? <laughs> and here's why. Um, it took us about, let's say, six months to put together the software packages that were required to see, uh, for the video that you just saw. Right? Obviously, everything was hacked together in a week. It was a hackathon. But all those individual building blocks were built uh, over the course of many months. Um, afterwards, we tried to take some of those modules and reuse them in other applications. Failure. We couldn't do that. Right? So the conclusion that we had was like, we need to build something a bit more generalized. You can't always like, just have one application in mind, build these modules, and expect they're going to rework in other applications. Um, so the conclusion that we had is like, we need more data. We need more robots. So anyway, we think that robots are stupid right now. They're not doing anything you know, interesting. You have to program them by hand, you know, and it's quite tedious. So because they're stupid, the consumer won't buy them. Right? Like, why would I buy a robot that doesn't do anything for me? So therefore, we don't really have enough robots in the field. And we don't have enough data. Right? So it's kind of this vicious circle, this you know, robot chicken and egg problem, as we call it, that we just can't, can't break, can't escape. If we had like, a lot of really good data, we could train a lot of different classifiers and build like, really complicated software, they would probably make robots a bit more intelligent. But we don't, as you'll see. So don't we already have, you know, people ask me, like, well, don't we already have a lot of pictures on the internet? Like, why do we mean we don't have enough data? There's so many snaps that everybody's taking all the time. Why can't we just use those? to train robots and you know, make, get like, smarter things done. And we also have stuff like deep learning these days. You guys know what deep learning is? Have you heard of deep learning? OK. So deep learning, I'll explain a little bit better, um, is pretty much a new concept that appeared in the AI machine learning community where um, you pretty much like, uh, take neural networks, um, make them a bit fancier, and you use them for uh, you know, classifying things right, or for regression. 
So the truth is that we are at a very interesting crossroad right now where we've been sort of like fooling ourselves that just by throwing more data, like you know, all these images into some black box that we call again deep learning neural networks and whatnot, we're going to like solve a very complicated problem. The reality is a bit different. First of all, right, the biggest problem that we have is that we're using the wrong kind of data. Right? So we have 2D images, but have 2D images been meant to be used for these kind of applications? Okay? So take the best sort of like approaches on the planet. Go to like the top conferences in the field, go to Google, to Facebook, to whatever company is kind of like kicks, kicks butt in this field, right, in image processing and, and recognition. And you will see that their products are not that great, right? And for a good reason, it's just very, very difficult to understand semantics. I'll give you a, a very brief example where, you know, just because your picture is under, uh, underexposed or overexposed, you're not gonna get any features, feature matches. You're not gonna be able to recognize anything, right? That's a very basic problem. And even when you do, right, are you matching you know, an object with an object or an object with a picture of the object? It's just very difficult. Imagine that robot that I mentioned earlier. You're programming it to bring you beer. It brings you an empty mug. That's a failure. Like, you don't want that, right? So more examples. Like, if you're trying to recognize things in the real world, you got a camera, you're moving it around, and you should have these kind of boxes, right, like always pop up in the right places. Like, a mug should always be a mug. But as you can see, as you're moving around from different angles, you know, mugs don't appear as, as mugs, right? And, and you get a lot of false positives uh, in, you know, in, in, the, in the background and so on. So negatives and false positives are, are killing recognition. And I think the generalized sort of uh, recognition has like really poor results right now. Okay? And, and no offense, but these are like state-of-the-art results in face recognition. Okay? This is what the best that we can do right now with all the classifiers that we're training and, and so on. So, uh, what about deep learning? This really cool thing that like popped up uh, a few years ago, and everybody's a craze of like you know money being invested, and you know, well, look, you know, it's machine learning, and this has been around for many, many years, right? There's many flavors of machine learning, and every you know five years or ten years, you get someone kind of look, looking at something that has been done before, sort of renaming it, making it a bit better, you know, incrementally. Uh, and then calling it something else and like going almost like viral in the community, right? Like, oh, this is the next be best thing. We're going to reinvent the human brain. This has happened many, many, many times. So the problem with these approaches, and you see, again, like lots of companies building this kind of stuff, is that you can recognize things in, that are very domain specific. So for example, if you're trying to recognize cats and you're only training those classifiers for cat recognition, you're probably going to do OK, right, after a while. Okay. There's some like negatives and, and whatnot here, right? Or false positives, sorry. Um, but it's, it's kind of okay. But how do you take this and apply it to everything else, right? I want to be able to like, know what's happening in the world at all times. How do you do that, right? So obviously, you know, entrepreneurs, and for a good reason, they're going out and they're saying, no, 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 now I can do cats. If you just give me a lot of money, I will be able to generalize this and we're going to do you know, very, very well in everything else, in all the other domains, right? And, and this is great. I mean, you guys should do that totally. If someone gives you money for this, that's fantastic. You're probably not going to solve it, but you're probably going like, to do a little bit better incrementally and so on and move in the right direction. Really, the way VCs should be thinking about this is like, well, let's try to do more than just one domain-specific problem. Let's try to solve like four, five, six, ten, and then we see that you have something that can generalize, and then we should give you money and you should start a business because otherwise you might fail. Well, the good news is that you might get acquired, right? Because a lot of companies, again, are just trying really hard to break through in this domain. So, in my opinion, in our opinion, actually, at Fusion Open Perception, there's problems that you're never going to be able to solve in an intelligent manner with 2D images. Just, you know, because we can't solve them as people, right? I mean, a lot of times we're thinking, well, yeah, that, that looks real, right? Like, that, that's true, because from that angle, it looks, it looks perfect, but it's not. So we have this thing called experience and so on, and associative memory, which helps us um, disambiguate these problems. So as I mentioned, it's very, very, very hard, hard, almost impossible to think that the current approaches that we have will just generalize and will work for everything, everything else out there. Okay. So as I mentioned, the kind of things that I want in my lifetime are at least things like this. More examples with this robot called the PR2. This was big, you know, a few years ago, a couple of years ago, like on CNN and all, you know, other, other uh, news media outlets. Um, so what they're doing right now, and bear in mind, there's, this, uh, there's a green screen behind it, so we're trying to simplify the problem. You know, we're folding towels. We're trying to sort, you know, socks in this case, right? 
And, and this is how the robots do it, right? Like, this is probably the best approach that you can think of for doing this kind of thing. I mean, if you have a better solution, we would love to hear it. But this is state of the art, OK? What you see on the left are, are again, like this, uh, so this application of folding towels initially took like 20 minutes per towel. That's kind of inefficient, right? Well, then we went back and optimized it, and you know, everybody was working really hard, and it, took, it went down to like three minutes, right? Still, like a lot. Like, imagine having to fold like 20 towels, right? So by the time we get to seconds, and then we actually bring in the real world, right, which is no more green screens, things are going to be really, really complicated. <laughs> so am I really getting that right now? No. <laughs> this is really what I'm getting. This is a state of the art in, in recognition in 2D. Okay. Again, no offense, man. So uh, I think it's safe to conclude that these biologically inspired approaches are not usually the best idea. And, and here's a very, very good example. Um, we cannot name any mammals or anything like that out there that have a wheel, right? Yet, as a model of locomotion, yet we as you know, inventors, engineers, and whatnot, create this wonderful thing, this circle, right, a wheel, that like right now, I mean, can you imagine our society like functioning without a wheel? It's so efficient, right? Like, look, look around you, right? Everything's sort of like circular and so on, and it works really well. So this is an example where you should probably try to think a little bit outside of the box for some of these really hard problems, and now just say like, well, because people do. Go ahead. I, do, I just have to say it's kind of tangential, but don't be old. Right. <laughs> <laughs> So, so like, don't, don't, don't always say, like, hey, well, we have, you know, people can, you know, we have, like, 2D cameras, basically, here, so we can, we can do it, therefore, computers should do it, because, you know, the Google brain or whatever is, like, I don't know how much, much more complicated than our, our own, but it's not necessarily, you know, the best way to go about it. So you should always try to think about some other things.